Okay, so that moment for me was when I started middle school. I remember that being the first time that I actually realized that the greatest consequence for not doing an assignment wasn't a zero. It was the fact that the class would move along without me and the learning would continue without my presence there. So I'm gonna start off by telling you a little bit about our school, PSIS 178, the Holliswood School. We're located in the Jamaica State section of Queens and Community School District 26. This school is especially near and dear to my heart because I'm a 178 graduate. I graduated from that school 25 years ago. I'm really old. Yeah. And nine years ago, I started teaching at that school when it expanded and became a pre-K to eight. Our current administration has just completed seven years there, and we service approximately, oh, sorry, sorry. And we service approximately 540 students um, we are a very diverse staff, we're a very diverse community. In 2008, we were recognized as a Blue Ribbon School, and for the past two years, we have been acknowledged as a New York State Department of Education Reward School, which, is me which means we're among the top 20% of all schools in New York State. And our last quality review, which was this spring, we received four well-developed out of the five quality review categories. So we have a lot to be proud of. Our project focus. So two ladies, Randy Engel and Faith Conant, they wrote an article about the guiding principles for fostering disciplinary engagement. And in that article, they discuss how students should be given the ownership to create convincing arguments supported with evidence. And that's at the heart of everything that we do at our school. So this quotation speaks to that in our project focus. Students learn when they're encouraged to be the authors of their own ideas and when they are held accountable for reasoning about and understanding key ideas. The first video that we would like to show you is from last year. Our seventh and eighth graders created a video where they focused on creating a culture of learning. So the video speaks to itself, and we can start it up. Do you have any comments? I mean, you have more respect for the work that we're doing. Because you can usually do every day that. Teachers should make sure that their students understand the material. And in ELA class, this is what we miss. Always make sure that Everybody understands the material well, and everyone understands what they're doing. So therefore, you're more engaged in the work and makes it better. I feel like the atmosphere is very engaged. The classes are very productive and very respectful. From like day one, Ms. Parham like initiated that the key aspect to succeeding in your class is respect. Reading class, the students are very engaged in their work. Since day one, Mrs. Parham was always talking about respect. If you give respect. Teaching strategies, and everyone knows what to do. And as my experience, I know what to do as a student in her class. Students are introduced to personal and academic behavior that they're expected to practice in order to be college and career ready. Expectations are clear, students are motivated, and a respect for the classroom, their peers, and the teachers are formed early in the year. It is made clear that with collaboration skills, organization, persistence, self-regulation, and engagement, students will be well prepared for any academic or personal endeavor. We work as a team, like a family, you could say. Mrs. Wilhelm is our mother, we are her children, and this classroom is our house. And just like any family, we partake in Eagles and plates come in and here and there, but we're still able to get the job done when it's time to work. I believe that Mrs. Parham provides us with the right skills to be college and career ready. In ELA class, I feel that as a student, I am taught to be authentic and true to myself. I feel as though students in Mrs. Parham's ELA class can express themselves however they like, even through writing. Mrs. Parham is able to give us the fundamentals of the Common Core so that we are not only prepared for state exams, but also what colleges are expecting students to do in the future as well. So we can honestly say that this was the birth of our project because it really pushed our thinking around college and career readiness and how we prepare our students for success after graduation, not just academically, but also with the social emotional readiness component. So this year, our instructional focus built on last school years, which was evidence and argument. 
And this year we really focused on student-to-student -student discussion and really watching how the evidence and arguments came across with our students. So as a faculty, every spring, we focus on trying to identify our goals for the upcoming year and we selected our instructional focus. So as Nicole Scott mentioned earlier, you might be wondering what SCOOP stands for. This is an acronym that I trademarked as soon as TC sent that invitation. Uh, so it stands for self-regulation, communication, collaboration, engagement, work habits, organizational skills, perseverance, and persistence. And we wanted an acronym that the students could easily remember, and it has ice cream on it. So um, that's something that we actually have ice cream t-shirts at school and really help them to remember uh, the SCOOP acronym. Uh, but the academic and personal behaviors that were guided by the DOE matrix really helped us to identify these core skills. So we knew that at the beginning of our journey, based on data from the environment survey, that we wanted to build on the middle school readiness skills in our elementary grades and the high school readiness skills for our middle school grades. Because we wanted our students to have success um, when they graduated from fifth grade and moved into the middle school and for our eighth grade students upon entering high school. So our first focus for our project was to improve our advisory program. We thought that was a great opportunity to focus on those scoop skills the personal and academic behaviors. We also wanted to increase student ownership over all aspects of learning with all of the school-wide initiatives. And we thought that through successful implementation of the initiatives and our May Parent Engagement Night, our students would be able to participate in student-led conferences. And this graphic just speaks to all the different things that we did around student ownership over their learning. There are pamphlets, I think there's one per table that kind of speaks to some of the things that we've done. So for example, the peer feedback and the discussion protocols, we use them to inc incorporate student voice and choice. So some of those protocols were PQP, Praise, Question, Polish, as well as ACE, which was created by one of our seventh grade students, Emily Abramov, and ACE stands for Applaud, Clarify, and Enhance. And in the younger grades, K-2, to they're also giving each other peer feedback using a protocol called TAG, where they tell their partner something that they like, they ask a question, and then they give that person feedback. So our goals for our students were to identify what the standards were and the way we unpacked it were, was to include I can statements and these were learning targets. So instead of having teaching points, the students would have an I can statement to really understand what the standards said. The student discussion protocols, so something new this year that we implemented in our upper grades were Socratic seminars across the board. Students were also able to internalize all of the discussion protocols in their classrooms. Peer feedback is something that we were very proactive with this year. As a school, we're a feedback school. I think 90% of our staff are athletes, so including myself. Not so, including me. <laughs> not Kim, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we really are a feedback school, we're always seeking feedback, and part of the collaboration, part of SCOOP is to really include opportunities for the students to give each other feedback. And then our final goal for our students was to culminate in May with being able to lead a student-led conference. So the first personal and academic behavior, I'm sure you're familiar with these, so I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Um, the resource that we use is from the Common Core Library. There is a matrix that takes these academic and personal behaviors and maps them to the Charlotte Danielson framework. So that was one way that we were able to introduce these to the teachers and to show them how they could embed them into daily instruction. So self-regulation is just this idea of self-control and having a filter, and we feel that the self-regulation would lead to resiliency in all of our students. And communication and collaboration, as discussed, embeds our instructional focus, which has to do with the student's ability to clearly communicate with one another, active listening skills, and really being able to give one another feedback. Engagement, we feel that student-centered learning is at the heart of student engagement, so we encourage our students to form healthy relationships with the teachers as well as their peers, and we also talk about the social-emotional connection that we want our students to make with the academics as well as what's going on at home. 
Work habits and organizational skills is something as a pre-K to 8 school from ages 3 all the way up to 14. We really pride ourselves in making sure we teach our youngsters how to be organized and also how to really attend to precision, particularly when they're solving problems in mathematics and really focusing on their writing and their reading. In our school, the students transition from fifth grade into middle school where they're able to go to different classrooms and this is something really key that we try to foster and uh, make sure that the students understand that you have to make sure that you're organized in order to prepare for high school. And last but not least, persistence and perseverance. We, current, we constantly encourage our students to seek out appropriate challenges because we feel that's what's gonna push them to becoming lifelong learners. So as Kim mentioned, advisory was something that we had in our school. We piloted it in 2011 because we really felt that the social emotional component of our curriculum was missing. So we wanted to have an opportunity for our students to have that moment where they could just not focus on academics, but have someone listen to them who, trust, who they trust and who also knows a little bit about their background. So for the past four years, the advisory program, we would say, has strengthened slightly over time, uh, where this past year, we kind of felt that we flatlined a little bit. We wanted to really change it up and add some elements so that there would be uh, some more pizzazz. So one of the things we did this year was we had our parent coordinator become an advisor and uh, it's really helped our school because she's a centerpiece, someone who the parents know. And she even did some home visits for us and we received so much feedback. So everyone from the social worker to our psychologist, our guidance counselor, our parent coordinator has a one to 10 ratio of students who they advise. And we also were able to improve upon our advisory structure by having student-led advisory this past spring. This year I was also an advisor, so I wear the hat as dean, that's one of the many hats that I wear. And I ran an advisory group with my sixth grade students, and I really use that as an opportunity to try to prevent some of the disciplinary issues that we had noticed were occurring in previous years, so I spoke to that, as well as the SCOOP behaviors. So our main project goals were to familiarize the student body with SCOOP, to talk about the behaviors, and also to get our colleagues to embed these into daily instruction. We also wanted to reinforce the connection between those personal and academic behaviors with other goals that we have throughout the school that would lead to the student ownership over learning. And we wanted to support all of our students pre-K through eight with these behaviors in preparation for the May student-led conferences. So the implementation, the action steps that we specifically took, we have a lot of survey monkeys in our school. I think I send this staff maybe survey monkey every week, every day. Uh, but it was really helpful to get their feedback. So we surveyed the students, we surveyed the teachers, the faculty, parents and guardians, we survey as well. Uh, we hold Coffee with the Principal events, and one of the topics this year was on student-led conferences, and parents absolutely loved the idea. We included some feedback from the parents in the bound uh, one copy per table packet that you have there. Um, and we planned and facilitated tremendous professional development on all of these uh, goals. Again, the Socratic seminar, we felt really moved the school as far as moving the students toward being articulate, defending themselves and their stances. The student-led discussions and lessons in action, once again, reinforced our previous instructional focus on evidence and argument but also watching the students really take accountability for their own learning and understanding the items in each rubric and being able to give a peer quality feedback based on the rubric was really an action. So March was our first pilot of the student-led conference and it started in grade one. And then by May, we were able to launch the student-led conferences almost school-wide. So this is just a quick glimpse of what some of our classrooms have. We try to use every inch of the wall you can see there. Uh, but <laughs> uh, we have charts, uh, discussion protocols, higher order thinking skills. So all of these charts really help the, the, the teachers as well because the students see these charts as artifacts and they're, they're able to remember some of the prompts. These teachers also had prompts on some of the student desks 
and slowly as the students were able to articulate these prompts without, without having it in front of them, teachers would slowly release the scaffold and take them off of the desk. And part of the learning targets were to make sure that the students knew what their flow of the day was. So across the school, the students know that their day has purpose and meaning. So the I can statements, the objectives of the day are constantly written out. And as administrators in the room, we know that this project, you know, doesn't go without its challenges. So just something that really was, was a challenge in the beginning was that a lot of our teachers felt that they wouldn't have the time to implement all of these initiatives this year. But we were able to build upon previous years and um, have a small group of teachers who were willing to pilot the student-led conferences. So time was an issue. We also tried to show teachers and our faculty that there was a shift in, in thinking about how students learn best. So as, we, as adults, we know that in order to learn even right now, you have to be engaged and you have to really want to learn and want to hear from um, what's going on with the, with, with the curriculum. So the focus on the social emotional as well as the academics was something important to us. The resources. We don't have it included in this slide, but a huge resource for us were the citywide instructional expectations because they really gave us our marching orders around college and career readiness and the need to focus on those personal and academic behaviors. We also used the advisory guide as a way to help restructure our advisory program. There was a lot of useful information around student-led conferences and a small cohort of teachers as well as the assistant principals and principals in our network, CFN 209, did a a book study using Ron Berger's Leaders of Their Own Learning, and that was a great tool for coming up with the learning targets and having all of the teachers eventually transition from having an aim or having a teaching point to having the I can statements, which allowed the students to digest the Common Core learning standards and make them more student friendly. So we want to show you a couple of examples of what the student-led conferences look like in May, and these again are the beginnings of what it could be. My favorite narrative essay was Earth Track and Awakes because I could use my imagination. My biography essay was the hottest because I had to do research and I had to do specific questions. Just trying to figure out your favorite as well. Yes, I'm happy. Yes, are you happy with your progress in writing from September now? Explain. Yes, because now I get better grades. I put way more details and, and, and thoughts in my writing. The most meaningful thing I learned was putting more details in my writing. So now we're up to the math. I really liked three digit edition because it was very fun because it was a very fun subject. The three digit subtraction was the most challenging because it was very hard to keep borrowing. My happiest moment in class was was we behave so we get rewarded. So my happy, happiest moment in class was meeting new friends and a new teacher and being still another one. <laughs> Our second video is a student who's been in our school for only two years. He speaks three languages. He's only been in the country for two years. He's a beginner intermediate L. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, before you get started, I just want to tell you how proud I am proud I am because I have seen how much you have grown since last year. Um, 
you came here from Italy and you actually know two other languages. You know Italian and Spanish and English is your third language. So I hope that you are proud of yourself because knowing three languages is not easy. So I'm very proud of you. Okay, so, so now you may begin. Nice to meet you. I'm going to start off with conferences with my experience. I'm really good at reading comprehensions. I have improved or looking for details when I read. Espana, quiero que tú conozcas a mi mamá. Mucho gusto. Thank you. So Daniel didn't speak any English two years ago, and he didn't really speak in class at all. So this is a huge accomplishment for him. So this was our first year piloting the student-led conferences. We are pleased that 36% of the teachers in our building were able to participate. And for those that who weren't able to this past May, we, we are pleased that they were able to do other things such as student-led gallery walks and portfolio presentations. And our hope is that in the future, perhaps in the November parent-teacher conferences, we'll have a higher participation rate. And there was tremendous impact on the teacher advance data as well. There was an increase in 3B for, from 2.91 last year to 2.98, and as well as 3C, which is engagement. So there was an increase from 2.86 to 3.14, and that really speaks to all of the efforts that the teachers have put in place. Overall impact on teacher growth, we just have a few testimonials there. Two of them are teachers who are actually retiring this year. One teacher of 34 years said it was awesome to speak to my parent. One of the students in our class said it was awesome to speak to my parent about my own work instead of the teacher doing it. One of my special education teachers said that it was amazing to see the students speak so eloquently about their own work and able to explain the processes. And another teacher that we had just felt that it was really empowering to be able to participate in this. So there was evidence of teacher growth, not only quantitatively, but qualitatively as well. And they really spoke highly about this process and how much they, they grew as well. So next steps for us, we have to do this all over again next year. <laughs> uh, but we, we shared some of our videos yesterday with our faculty. We shared our, our con project with them. We now have a collection of videos on SLCs, and we also have a collection of videos on Socratic seminars. Uh, just about everything, we had so much content, we didn't know what to select for here. Uh, but that's really going to lead our PD for next year. And as far as setting a goal, we obviously want to go from 36% of teachers to 100% of teachers. We are going to continue to monitor which students no longer need those scaffolds. We're going to create a timeline, again, to repeat this work and to really sustain it. And for our professional staff, we are going to attend some institutes about really trying to, to focus again on the non-cognitive factors and the scoop behaviors and how it affects performance. One of our CEP goals this year is related to ownership and the social emotional piece. I know we're short on time, so maybe we can have one or two questions while the other group sets up. Our final presentation for the day is, if you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? Jane Shu, Kristen Delaney, and Erica Silverstein from PS116 in Manhattan. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is the final presentation of the day. So to sweeten the deal, you all have a little bag on your table. Feel free to dig into it. There's some little goodies for you. Um, and we also, I know this is rare, whenever you're at a conference, I don't know if anyone has ever asked you to do this, but we are encouraging you to take out your cell phone or your laptop 
or your tablet, have it ready to use in just a few moments. So we're going to give you the time right now to do that. <laughs> You'll find in your bag, those of you who've opened it, some Condi named after Chuck Con. Um, <laughs> we thought about chucking you some Condi just to get everyone really excited um, since it's, our, it's the last presentation of the day. But we'll begin with saying that we can do it. <laughs> so I am so proud to come today as a representative of PS116 in Manhattan and so extremely excited to have by my side two of my wonderful special education teachers. I'm Erica Silverstein. And I'm Kristen Delaney. And together we embarked on a journey over the past year. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about our school, PS116. We are located in Manhattan in the Murray Hill neighborhood, uh, Murray Hill neighborhood on East 33rd Street. We are so fortunate and very proud that we serve quite a diverse population, one of the most diverse populations of New York City. Our children come to us with a wide range of academic and behavioral or social experiences, as well as a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds. We serve children who live on Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue, and also in the neighborhood low-income subsidized housing projects of the New York City Housing Authority. And we're extremely proud that we represent, or we are the neighborhood school, for a temporary housing facility for children and their mothers who are currently out of permanent housing. We also serve a great number of children of United Nations diplomats. So with those last two subsets of children, you can imagine that there's this flux and we're constantly trying to bring in new students, assess them quickly, and really understand who they are. They may be with us for two days, they may be with us for four weeks, or they may be with us for six years. Regardless of how long they are with us, our job as a school community is to really make sure that they achieve progress in all areas of their learning. Out of the 700 children at PS116, about 16% of our students have IEPs, or individual education, individualized education plans. We firmly believe in inclusive education. And over the past 10 years, we have developed and strengthened our inclusive education program, quite often taking in students who may have been recommended for a more restrictive environment elsewhere in the district. That comes with challenges, and a lot of these students come with a lot of needs, socially, emotionally, and cognitively. Our teachers have worked very hard to nurture every single student who comes through our doors. A great emphasis has been placed on building their self-esteem and really emphasizing that every child comes with abilities and we need to respect every child's abilities that they possess. What we started to notice, however, is that as much as our teachers are so nurturing and so often trying to build up the self-esteem of students and making sure that they feel as though they belong in our community, the academic tasks that we were presenting to students often were very over-scaffolded by teachers. And that led us to wonder, are our teachers doing the thinking for our students? So that was the basis of our con challenge, which is how do we support teachers to encourage students with disabilities to engage in productive struggle to achieve academic progress? This was our challenge, our goal for this year. So goals, we all create them, we all set them. Principles, each year you have to submit goals for your CEPs. As special educators, we're constantly creating goals for our students' IEPs. We set them for our schools, we set goals for our students, we set them for ourselves professionally, we even set them for ourselves personally. Let's actually take a moment to think about 
a personal goal that many of us set each year, our New Year's resolution. So take some time. Maybe it's your New Year's resolution from this year, maybe from past years. Okay. Now we're going to take a brief survey, and this is where you need your devices for anything that you can access the internet from or text from. Okay. On, on a scale, whoa, on a scale, <laughs> from strongly agree to strongly disagree, please answer the following statement honestly. I regularly meet my New Year's resolution. You can go ahead and respond at pollev.com backslash Jane Shu 242, or you can text Jane Shu 242 to the number listed on your packets. Everybody had a chance pretty much to vote or survey, whatever. Oh, start. Okay. Um, so, as Eric was saying, whether at home or in the workplace, um, hold on. Whether at home or in the workplace, self importance, self improvement, excuse me, is something that we all try to achieve. This is a cultural attitude that is highlighted at the start of the new year with resolutions to do better in the coming months. However, for many of us, and looking at this data, <laughs> we're mostly all in the same boat, um, these aspirations to do better don't always translate into achievement. So then what does it take to uh, achieve a goal that you've set for yourselves? For those of you who have achieved a goal they've set for yourself, for, that you have set for yourself, what do you, to what do you attribute your success? Can we hear out from, just popcorn out from anybody in the audience? Please? Commitment. What did you say? Creating a plan. Excuse me, creating a plan. Persistence. Other people working alongside you. Putting it out there, yes. Sure. Ah, accountability. So it seems like some of the big support systems that people have identified here mostly pertain to time, collaboration, and having a plan with benchmarks. So those of you who have not been successful in meeting a goal that you may have set, it might be interesting for you to know that out of the 40 some American, 40% of some Americans who set New Year's resolutions each year, only 8% of them are successful in meeting their goals. So here we were at the start of the year, very excited about our con challenge, on an open road, ready for our journey, raring to go, much like I have been many years <laughs> with a New Year's resolution, just wanting to give it another try. But we really didn't know where we were going. We didn't know which path we were taking. So that led us to going back and taking a look at this from a totally different perspective and trying to understand what, what are we doing? We knew, there was, we knew there was purpose behind this goal. We just didn't know how to get there. So that left us thinking, if, if you don't, don't know where you're going, going how will you know when you get there? <laughs> So we didn't know exactly what path to take, but we had in mind what our major goal was. And we also had an idea that this might all begin with IEP goals, which by right, for students with disabilities, is what is supposed to help monitor their progress and drive their progress. 
And if they're not making academic progress, then perhaps the goals that we've set for them are not appropriate. OK. So whenever you're faced with a challenge, you need to come up with a plan. Someone actually just said that. You need to create a plan for how you're going to accomplish that goal. So let's just say I want to set a goal for myself that I want to run the marathon. I know that in order to accomplish this goal, I need to run 26.2 miles. Woo! But in order to make a plan for how I'm going to achieve that, I actually need to know how many miles I can currently run, right? So this is what we needed to do, relating it back to our goal. We needed to take stock at where we currently stood in terms of IEPs and IEP goals. So to assess this, we needed to ask ourselves, how are the IEP and IEP goals being used in regard to instruction and to students' academic growth? So we gave our ICT teachers a survey. The results were eye-opening. 90% of our teachers that took the survey said that they did not regularly plan with students' IEP goals in mind. Also, 60% of our teachers said that they did not feel comfortable or confident in their ability to write appropriate and measurable goals. So just like many of our New Year's resolutions, it seems that our IEPs and IEP goals were losing relevance in our classrooms due to the competing priorities that our teachers felt throughout the year. So in the face of this baseline data, we are left asking ourselves, how can we make our goals more present in our planning and teaching? So let's go back to some of those supports identified by uh, those of you earlier who have had success in achieving a goal. One of the major supports that people um, did identify was having a plan, having a plan with benchmarks. When you take a goal and you break it down into smaller, more measurable parts, it makes it feel far less daunting. Um, to go back to the example of running a marathon. Awesome, we're gonna run a marathon. <laughs> we're gonna run 26.2 miles, great. I'm only running five miles right now. How am I going to get myself from, those, from running five miles to running 26.2 miles. I need a plan and I need some benchmarks. I'm not just gonna go out tomorrow and run 15 miles. That's not gonna end well for anyone. <laughs> um, instead, I might come up with a plan. I might decide to increase my mileage bi-weekly. In two weeks, running seven miles. In another two, running nine, maybe 10, if I'm ambitious. Um, until I eventually get to my 26.2 miles. By breaking it down again into smaller parts and having a plan, the goal becomes more achievable and it's more likely that you're going to succeed. In the end, this was the tack that we decided would be the best for us in getting back on track with our con challenge. So we came up with a short-term objective for ourselves. This was create appropriate and measurable IEP goals which will lead to more tailored and purposeful instruction resulting in higher engagement of students with disabilities. We also realized that this project was going to be much bigger than just the three of us, and they were going to need, that we were going to need to call on key members of our faculty and outside resources in order to tackle the challenge. This was a pivotal moment for us back in January. We specified our focus, and we were ready to put our plan into action. Kind of left us thinking, how do we make this doable in our classes? Well, this is when we introduced our project to the other ICT teams, as well as our special education consultant, Kristen Goldmansor. You might even notice, as our journey continues and more people come on, come on board, our car is going to get larger and larger as the presentation continues. <laughs> so along with the ICT survey, we had a meeting with the ICT teams and our special ed consultant, Kristen Goldmansor, and we saw a lot of excited energy from all the teachers, yet their feedback kept bringing us back to a few challenges, one of which seems to be our Achilles heel, time, or lack thereof, right? So as a result of this, we've created an IEP period where all of the special educators come together one time a week and we collaborate and we improve our IEP goals. This IEP period has been in place since January and throughout this time, we have developed cross-curricular cross goals based on high leverage skills. We've analyzed student work. We've created adaptive materials. 
We've set up data collection systems. We've even calibrated our use of language and our expectations around the IEP. This collaboration was so powerful that we knew that we couldn't stop here, which led us to collaborative study. <laughs> So those of you from New York City Public Schools know that this year every school has within their structure 80 minutes of professional development after school on Mondays. We've been spending that time as a school community working mostly in small groups and focusing on different areas but all with the theme of increasing student engagement. So after input feedback from our ICT teams, the three of us came back together and decided it would be a really, really powerful thing to be able to break out of the groups we had already set up and introduce an additional study group for which, from which teachers could choose. And that group is focusing on, or that group has been focusing on making IEPs more present in our daily teaching and learning. It's also been Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Our study has been grounded in this fabulous book, if you don't know it. It's called Data Without Tears. Um, and it actually just provided a much, cl a much clearer idea for us as to what is important to put into an IEP goal. In addition, now that you can see that our vehicle has turned into a VW van, um, through the assistance of Christina Foti from the Department of Education, she was able to put us in touch with Sarah Evans and Jen Yonkers. And they have come to work with our Monday study group of ICT teams a couple of times to really help us identify and develop high leverage cross-curricular goals for our students with IEPs. We are so proud of our accomplishments thus far this year. We thought we would share with you some reflections from a first year special education teacher. Coming in as a first year teacher, I felt like I wasn't confident in writing goals. I felt like um, I didn't really know who to go to for support in writing these goals. And I kind of wrote the goals based on the last year's goals, um, trying to work language around what they were said, um, what was said on the previous IEP. Um, and since we have been talking more about how to write these goals, I've learned so much about the language that should be put into them, how they should be specific, um, and all these elements that I was not using in writing my goals previously. So this environment has really helped shape my view. Um, I'm writing these very specific and natural. So just as our collaborative study group got us feeling more comfortable and confident writing IEP goals, um, our work with Sarah Evans and Jen Yonkers and Kristen Goldmunzer um, had us thinking about how we can write broader skill-based goals that could be taught into across the day. So once we had this whole goal situation ironed out a bit and we're feeling better about it, we had another question for ourselves. And this was, how can we support teachers to efficiently and consistently monitor, excuse me, monitor a student's progress towards these goals across the course of the year? So after a little uh, brainstorming and a lot of collaboration, we came up with a pretty neat tool to do just that. Let's take a look. And the best part about this tool is it provides an automatic summary of the results and it even um, puts it in this neat little pie graph for you and you don't have to do anything. 
So let's hear from another one of our special ed teachers. Uh, support structures that we have in place are supporting uh, me in making um, more measurable and appropriate goals because um, you know we have the chance to work all together. So it seems more supportive, collaborative, and cohesive. You know, talking about what the expectations are from year to year um, because we often do have students um, that are in our classrooms might be working on something from a grade um, or two below. Um, and so it's nice to hear what other people are working on in their classrooms. So let's just take a look back at our journey so far this year. We started off with a challenge to support teachers in encouraging students with disabilities to engage in productive struggle in order to make academic progress. That challenge was so huge that we ended up having to step back and create a short-term objective for ourselves, which was to actually create appropriate and measurable IEP goals. After a year's worth of collaboration, you've heard from two of our teachers, we feel like we're in a very good place with our ICT teams. They talk about the increased collaboration, the increased calibration of the language they're using, and our next step, we feel, is that we want to take this school-wide um, and, and involve every teacher in the process of helping to create goals for students as well as to help monitor the progress toward those goals. And if yesterday's conference, Chancellor's Conference Day was of any indication of how our faculty is feeling, we actually introduced all of this work that we've been doing with our ICT teams to the rest of the faculty and they were amazed at all the hard work that has been taking place behind our closed doors, I guess, or in, within our own classrooms. But, um, so there's energy and there's excitement about continuing this work and, and bringing it to the school-wide level. So as we continue on this journey, and we see this as being at least a three to five year project, if not longer. If you've ever tried to write an IEP goal, you'll understand why. <laughs> but as we continue on this journey, we hope that we'll be able to draw upon the lessons that have emerged for us this year as it, as it pertains to leadership. As school leaders, whether you have the title or not, we have to work to create or establish an environment that helps teachers feel safe enough to be honest about the challenges they are facing. If they're not honest and they're not telling you, how in the world are school leaders going to be able to respond to those teachers' needs? And finally, it's so critical that there's shared distributive leadership when taking on a challenge. And all of these pieces together is what leads to transformative change within a school. So we definitely would not be in the place that we are today without the help of everyone listed on the slide. We started off as a cohort, or sorry, we started off as just the three of us and now we are of a cohort of 20 staff members and four outside school resources who we are very fortunate to have here supporting us today as well. And we wanted to thank <laughs> Chuck Kahn for giving us the opportunity to be a part of the Kahn Fellows Program. And of course, Lily Wu, Robin Walker, all of our, all of our instructors, but especially Ellie Drago Severson and Victoria Marsick for your guidance in helping us understand our own leadership styles and what we need to keep in mind as we're working with various adult learners. So thank you for that. So before we get into our Q&A, we actually would like everyone to get on up, take a look under your seat, and if you see the picture that matches this one on this golden bag, we can do it. Oh, we have a winner. You are the fine new owner of a brand new copy of Data Without Tears. Congratulations. So our final words to you are, if, if we can do it, so can you. <laughs> 
Probably all ready to get to lunch, that's okay. How much are we sharing about our data tool? I don't know, that's the question. Um, what do you want to know about the data tool? Um, we just want to see more of it. Of it? So basically what it is is we use a form, a Google form, um, and it's basically the Google survey form. But we put in the um, goals, the short-term objectives, and then you can just input your data and it will um, spew out for you a, your results as well as the pie chart. And included in that is also the levels of support. Um, oh, if yes, the child's doing it independently or if you're modeling it for, for them, um, that's all um, pluggable. Yeah, definitely. So all those hands were for the data tool. <laughs> Go ahead. I was wondering, in terms of the data tool, because they have to enter those goals onto CSIS also, did you get pushback that they were doing double work? Do you want to talk? Yeah. Sure. So the um, on CSIS, we are just monitoring the progress um, twice a year when report cards go out. Is that what you mean? Um, like the actual. Oh, like the inputting. Um, it actually, it's, the tool is really helpful because in CSIS there's not always a space to put short-term objectives. Um, children that receive alternate assessment can have short-term objectives inputted into their IEP, um, whereas other students who are participating in statewide testing cannot have short-term objectives plugged in. So the tool is really helpful for us to break down the goal into smaller steps um, to have a plan, so to speak, to meet that goal. So the tool actually was our stepping stone, which will help us um, inform um, you know, parents as to how their children are doing in CSIS. And as far as the time, we also have now implemented this IEP period where we have extra time, if you are a special education teacher, a week, an extra sort of prep period. So that's time where you could input the goals from the uh, IEP into the survey. Sorry, I keep forgetting about this side of the room. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.